If you've ever used a camera in 3D, you know getting good results isn't easy. But I believe great cinematography can turn a project from kinda bad to really good. So in this video, I'll be taking a 3D scene and transforming it to look as cinematic as possible using only the camera and compositing. But here's the catch. By the end, I'll be showing this to a real cinematographer who actually went to school for this and ask him, what would you rate this? I think I would... Uh... I'm a big fan of movies and shows and have probably watched thousands in my life. So I feel I've managed to build up a decent eye for a good looking shot. So I created a scene, researched tons of different cinematic techniques and effects, and even interviewed my judge on his ideas on cinematography. But even with all that, I'm still unsure that I have the know-how to get a good grade. But if I do, I'll have managed to not only impress an actual cinematographer, but also learned a few things to take my cinematography skills to a higher level. How this scene looks before adding in a camera though is actually quite important because a bad looking scene will probably not help me make something cinematic no matter what I do. Uh, as I said, I've watched more movies than I can count, but my all time favorite to this day is Interstellar. Specifically, I love the part on Miller's planet where a huge wave is coming for the main characters. So I got this asset from Sketchfab, which is one of the astronauts, gave it some very basic animation of it looking back and forward creating an ocean simulation using the ocean modifier on a plane and added a water material, which is mostly just a dark reflective material with the proper IOR and the foam attribute data from the ocean modifier to create some whitewash on the waves. Next, I added one of the amazing Pure Sky HDRIs from Polyhaven and then I put the water simulation in a collection, instance death collection to get a performance boost and started duplicating it tons of times to create the entire ocean surface. I then created a huge wide cube and moved that all the way back, gave it some subdivisions, added displacement and added the same water shader to it to act as the giant wave in the background. Finally, I added in some volumetrics, but I mostly did this to hide the obvious seam of where the ocean ended and to create some depth. This is now the basis for our project. It's nothing fancy, but I feel like it's a good base point to really showcase how cinematography can improve a scene and hopefully get a passing grade from our judge. Before being able to think about things like compositing, we'll need a camera in the scene. Blender's camera is extremely versatile and it can do things an actual camera can't, like having an extremely small or large focal length or aperture. And when it comes to focal lengths, I just tend to use whatever looks nice. good. But I asked Polyfert what his thoughts were on this matter, and this is what he said. I think the focal lengths that we currently have, they come from primarily technical limitations. So I think that as the technology is improving, we might see different real life lenses but i definitely think that we have to remember when we are 3d artists that we can't really go crazy if we want to recreate a real life experience of watching a movie we're gonna have to stick to the rules now i looked it up and camera lenses for movies range anywhere from 18 to 100 millimeters with 28 to 35 being most common and this is also true for Interstellar, where most shots were done with an anamorphic 24 to 55 millimeter lens. So I'll be using a 35 millimeter focal length for this scene to capture a pretty wide angle shot because I want to capture as much of the wave as possible. Now with the camera edit, I need to decide on where to place it and how to move it. This is something cinematographers like to call purposeful camera motion. And Polyfjord actually gave a full talk on this during last year's Blender conference, which was one of the main inspirations for me to learn more about cinematography too. And besides that, he also had to say the following. You have to really consider, has this camera operator experienced this before? Because if you're a 3D artist and you're trying to make something look cinematic, you have to be aware that at some point the technical skill of the camera operator comes into the picture. Is this rehearsed or is this happening for the first time? When you have decided that, that just gives you so much strength to plan your scenes. I feel like that's the number one principle I would like to highlight when we're talking about like intentional camera movement. Now, before we continue, being a self-employed creative really puts on the pressure at times. And I've seen from personal experience with my own family what depression and burnout can do to a person. Regularly talking to a professional through BetterHelp can help prevent these issues. BetterHelp is this video's paid partnership. One of the things I like best is that I can contact a credentialed therapist who is ready to listen and provide unbiased advice easily without having to leave the house or my area overall. 
With BetterHelp, you can choose how you want your therapy sessions. Phone call, video call, or even just messaging. It's all about making therapy as comfortable as possible for you. Plus, getting started is really simple. Fill out a questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, in most cases within 48 hours, and schedule sessions when you have the time for them. And if it turns out you don't feel a good match with your matched therapist, that's no issue at all. You can just change to another therapist without any additional cost. So if you think you might benefit from therapy, be, consider BetterHelp through the link in my description or visit betterhelp.com slash kaizen. Not only does it support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off on the first month, making it easier to connect with a therapist and see if this is the right fit for you. Remember, mental health is important. I know there is still a major stigma for us men to not talk about our feelings. There's no shame in talking to someone about your struggles. And I believe that's why over 4 million people have used BetterHelp to live a healthier, happier life. For this project, the story is that my character here is standing in awe of this giant wave coming towards him, but he's also aware of his surroundings turning around. So as the director, my idea is to first reveal where we are, then show the character since he's important, and finally hint towards the giant wave looming in the background. And to do that, I'll point the camera down to begin with, first revealing this ocean landscape. Then we can slowly pan upwards and at the same time move towards our character. At this point, it's also important to think about the composition of the shot. When I asked Polyford about this, he said, I think there are like two schools when it comes to composition. You have the one part is people that are using the grids on their phones. You know, they're lining it up. They're using the theoretical principles like as a very strict guide. And then you have the other type of people who are sort of just going with a gut feeling every single time. Yeah, I think both ways are fine. For me, I always just go with a gut feeling until it works. And then I, I never use like a grid or yeah, stuff like that. But I can definitely see the value for those who do. And I agree that doing this by eye is an option once you've developed the feeling for shots. If you're still working on this technique though, or maybe you just want perfect composition no matter your skill, Blender offers built-in composition guides for cameras. Just select the camera, go to Viewport Display, Composition Guides, and choose whichever you want. The most common options are thirds and the golden ratio, but both serve the same goal, balancing your image. The rule of thirds is quite simple to use. You basically just align the subject to the left or right third of your camera and leave the other two thirds open. This almost always results in a compelling, well-composed shot, and it's what I want to use for this scene. With our camera now set up for a properly balanced composition, we can fly past the character using a simple keyframe animation so we can shift the focus to the way. And speaking about focus, this might be a good moment to add some depth field. On actual cameras, depth of field occurs naturally as a side effect of the technical capabilities of the lens. In Blender, however, we're able to use an insanely large or small depth of field, commonly called f-stops. And although I recently learned that getting the right depth of field comes down to using the right skill in your Blender scenes, Polyfjord has something else to say. It's interesting how we when you're doing the aperture in Blender, I was always under the impression that you have to really specifically match the exact aperture and you have to match the sensor size and you have to be very strict about it. But to a certain degree, the blurry aspect of a render is kind of artistic, actually. I just don't think you need to be exactly precise. I think you can just eyeball it and it will look great. Yeah, the only time I really tried to be strict on scale was when I made the Mechanical Creature Kit, my asset pack. It was a challenge to try and be strict about it when I hadn't really done it before. Because then you really feel the aperture limitations in Blender. In my case, I already made the scene using proper skill. So using real-world f-stop values is probably possible. In the beginning of this shot, I want the focal point for the depth of field to continuously be the character, because we want to highlight the character. And once the camera flies in front of our character, I think it's cool to shift the depth of field point or the focal point further out, basically emphasizing the wave in the distance. But if we use Blender's focus object target, you'll notice we can't switch it later on. There's no way to animate this. We could, however, animate this distance value below it, but it's tedious, unintuitive, and generally just not a great tool to use. So instead, I want to use an empty and use that as the depth of field target. Now it's just a matter of animating the position of this empty, which is really quite simple. It just needs to stay in the same place until the camera is almost past our character and then it just shoots forwards a bunch. With that done, we can set our f-stop to a nice low value like for example 1.7, which would still technically be possible with an actual camera and create this nice depth of field effect for the shot. So as I mentioned before, Interstellar was shot on an anamorphic lens just like tons of other movies. 
Now, just like me, you might not be familiar with what an anamorphic lens is. I'm actually still unsure as to how it works. But from what I do understand, though, an anamorphic lens creates a wider image common in cinematic productions with a shallower depth of field and things like stretched bokeh. It also results in the typical movie aspect ratio with those famous black bars and is used to add that dramatic depth and dimension often seen in movies. In Blender, however, we don't really have a lens, so creating these effects requires some additional steps. The first one is to work with a resolution that movies commonly use. I found a handy list of common formats, and for this project, I'll be working with the Cinema DCP 2K scope format. I use scope because this is the aspect ratio that anamorphic lenses output. So let's set our resolution in Blender to 2048 to 858, and that should be a good start, but it won't create the stretched wide look of an anamorphic lens. To do that, we need to do something kind of weird because we need to set the aspect Y here to two. This will turn your camera in the viewport to somewhat of a square. And if you then render, it doesn't look like a square at all, but it instead is just all squashed down. So to now compensate this squash, we can go into compositing, add a skill node and scale the image by two on the Y axis. Let's also add in a lens distortion node here and add in some minimal distortion and dispersion. Now this will generate the anamorphic look, compressing more pixels vertically on the camera and then scaling those back up to fit the shot, making the shot immediately look that much more cinematic. For comparison, here's the same frame, but without an anamorphic lens set up. So our camera is now all set up, but before we show this to Polyfjord, there's still a few more things we can do to make the project all the more cinematic. You can do incredibly intricate things using compositing, and if you want to, you can spend hours tweaking your shots just like is done for movies. However, even with some basic changes, we can already add so much to our images. The first thing we're gonna add is pretty simple and it comes down to using the proper color management. Blender 4.0 just introduced the AGX view transform as the replacement for the older filmic look. In this scene, using AGX over filmic looks slightly different, but in brighter scenes with more light, AGX creates way better highlights with proper Upper exposure and saturation. Now, some people like to use filmic log, which creates a desaturated log image, just like a camera recording in raw log footage would, and then do all the correction and grading in post. However, when I asked Polyford about this, he said the following. The purpose of log is basically just to circumvent some compression artifact. So the compression won't be as mean to the details that you want to preserve. It's just a simple hack basically to circumvent some compression artifacts. So in Blender, we won't need that since we can export you know, unlimited dynamic range, uncompressed EXR. If you're working at EXR, you shouldn't have to use log. So since we're using AGX, let's set the look to punchy for a sharper contrast. This also darkens the image somewhat, but we can fix that using the next step in this process, for which we need to move over to the compositing tab. Color grading. Color grading is the process of taking an image and altering the color data for a certain look. Straight out of the render, the colors in the image are fine. But in this case, I want to alter them slightly for a more washed out and neutral look, obviously inspired by the actual scene in the movie. To do that, I'll use a color balance node and make sure to plug that in before doing things like distortion or skill, so the image first gets graded before it gets altered. The color balance node has two options, but I usually use the offset power slope version as I like the results better. Now we can use the color wheels and grayscale sliders to change the look of the image. And while doing this, I like to have a visual reminder open of what look I'm trying to achieve. I'm not super experienced in color grading whatsoever, so mimicking a look is usually easier for me than trying to figure out things on my own. Now I think the final result is a tad strong, so I'll decrease this factor slider here to have the original image come through a little more. Great, things are coming along nicely and there's only two more things I want to add in. The first of which is vignette. Vignetting. vignetting is a darkening of the edges of an image to draw interest to the center of it. We can create this in the compositor by adding in a box or ellipse mask. By selecting the node, we can see the size of the mask shown in this white line here. So let's just scale that up to be slightly smaller than the image and combine it with the original image through an alpha over node. This will add the mask on top of the image, but as you can see, it's very sharp. So to finalize this, let's add in a blur node in between and give it a big X and Y value, something like 250. Now we get a smooth vignette look, which I think adds a nice touch to this image. The final thing I wanna add is grain. Why? Well, with the real cameras, this comes naturally. There's two types of cameras in the real world, 
film and digital. Digital cameras are the ones we all know, and I'm recording this video on a digital camera. For example, your phone also has a digital camera. It stores the data directly on a digital format. Film cameras, on the other hand, still use actual film to record to, creating another type of grain you probably recognize from older movies. Although, these film cameras have been on the rise again, and Christopher Nolan, the director of Interstellar, uses them in most of his films. Besides rendering noise, which we're going to set aside for this, Blunder will, if using enough samples, produce an infinitely clean image and this is not very cinematic since real cameras don't do that. So I'm going to add in some grain using some 35mm grain footage I found online for free. It's really cool and I've been using it in my videos for a while now to add some texture. To use it in Blender though is really simple. Just add in an image node in the compositor, open up the grain footage, set the frame length and start frame. I usually just use the project frame length here. And finally, make sure to enable cyclic so it auto repeats and auto refresh. So Blender refreshes the image per frame. Finally, since we don't want to add in additional color, let's set this to non-color and use a mix color node set to overlay to combine the noise with the image. Now, when I asked Polyford if he uses grain, he had a very different and interesting technique to show. Okay, so here we have an image that has highlights and it has shadows. So the trick is to use this thing called uh, the the texture, just make a new texture and you set it to clouds, for example. And now in the compositor here, now you have the texture. You can just add it here. So now you get the textures in the compositor, which are like procedural. And then the whole point is to adjust the scale. You get the correct noise size. And then eventually you can just type hashtag frame for the offset. And then every frame you will get a new noise. The trick is to use the color mix node. For example, you can use lighten. Yeah, now you can see that the, sh the noise is in the dark here. If you set it to overlay, now you can see you have primarily noise in the highlights here. The shadows doesn't really have that much noise. But if you set it to linear light, then you can see we have a little bit less noise in the highlights and more noise in the shadows. All right, so that's our final setup. And this is how the final animation straight from Blender with all the compositing looks. kind of scared it feels like i'm back in school now and somebody's going to review my stuff and rightfully so because polyfjord actually had a lot of feedback if you're filming someone in real life they are not going to be like low poly you know the ocean is uh, is a pattern so you can see that like i'm struggling to understand what's the reason to why there's like the horizon is a little bit off i think the, the tilting might be too fast for what you're what is comfortable to look at an ocean that is this calm would have that much white water on it and so it all came down to this one final question what would you rate this i think i would uh, i think i'm giving it an eight out of ten. Oh, so uh, i passed yeah. yeah yeah that's a pass yeah i definitely think that there are professional compositors compositors that uh, don't know half the stuff that you've been talking about today so yeah you you could have been uh, yeah this i think this looks really good and so even though he could tell this scene was thrown together quite rapidly he did really like all the cinematographic changes that i did to really transform the scene now if you want to see the full 45 minute interview that i did with polyfjord make sure to become a patron or youtube member to get exclusive access to that video and although you now know some great cinematographic tips and tricks, there's a few more to learn in this video here.